Hello. Hello to all of you in Portugal and other parts of the world, and uh, welcome to the Dean's Lounge, which is an initiative of Porto Business School. The Dean's Lounge is, a, is meant as a forum for reflection, where the Dean, the Associate Dean of Porto Business School, invite distinguished scholars, speakers, deans, and, and colleagues uh, from business schools around the world to discuss issues that are uh, relevant for the future of business, for government, economy, and society in general. Any conversation these days uh, revolves around, inevitably, around the virus, obviously. Uh, our lives have changed completely in a short time, as the world has been overwhelmed by its effects. And uh, we are looking for a way to deal with these fears, these uncertainties. The uh, COVID-19 pandemic um, started slowly, but then suddenly began to create great anxiety because of its exponential growth and the large number of hospitalizations and deaths. By now, all of us have become familiar with terms that we may not even have heard just a few, few weeks ago, just like social distancing and flattening the curve. Indeed, the pandemic has generated and continues to generate a lot of pain and a lot of uncertainty to our health system, to our social interactions, to our economies. And a shock of this scale is disrupting our lives, is shifting our expectations for the future. We do not know how the crisis will evolve. It still remains to be seen, but it its impact on, on how we live, how we work, and how we use technology is something that will emerge clearer, in a more clear way, in the coming weeks and, and months ahead. As Winston Churchill said, never waste a good crisis. I'm sure you have heard that one before. Uh, hopefully, we can use this crisis to rebuild and to produce a better and more humane society. Or maybe not. Who knows? There are a number of possible futures. It will all depend on how governments and society respond to the virus and its economic aftermath. The head of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, said, the only effective solution to this crisis in Europe is one based on cooperation, flexibility, and above all, above all solidarity. I repeat, cooperation, flexibility, and above all, solidarity. Solidarity? Well, look around. Each country in Europe has adopted its own approach within its own borders. This is understandable in the short run, but the virus does not stop at the border. In the longer run, this pandemic can only be controlled with a coherent cross-border approach. But how far are we from such approach? What about this cooperation, flexibility, and solidarity in Europe? And not only in Europe, in the world in general. Well, to reflect on these issues today, we bring Stefan de Felder, who is with us and will help us understand some of these issues from a, from a Dutch perspective. Uh, Steve is a professor of operations uh, management and technology at the Rotterdam School of Management, or RSM, as it's also known. Uh, and RSM is the business school of Erasmus University in the Netherlands, uh, which is one of the best universities in Europe. So Steve has worked at RSM for 23 years and has been dean of the business school for eight years. In fact, he stepped down at the start of this academic year, and then he took a well-earned sabbatical, which brought him to different parts of the world. In fact, he was traveling in Latin America when the pandemic stopped him in Peru, and he got st stuck there for several weeks. Only recently, he has been able to, to come back. He has been repatriated back to the Netherlands, mm -hmm. and I'm sure he can share some of these experiences uh, during that period. So hello, Steve, and, and welcome to the Dean's Lounge of Porto Business School. Uh, good afternoon, Ramon. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a big honor to be here, at least virtually here. And I yeah. hope that we have a very fruitful and entertaining discussion. Sure. Conversation. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Uh, as I was mentioning in my introduction, you, you, you recently returned from Peru. Uh, in fact, the first time I contacted you and asked you to participate in the Dean's Lounge, you were still in Peru. And then I thought, well, we might have this session while you're still there. And, and 
and, and, and talk about how things are uh, in that part of the yeah. world, which I'm sure uh, will be interesting to, to hear. And in the meantime, you manage to return. But in any case, I'm sure your memories are still fresh. Uh, what did you tell That's us right. a little yeah. bit about yeah. this trip, you know, the motives? What, what were you doing there in the first place? And, and how did you first get the news about COVID-19? If you had been traveling for several months, probably when you left, there was no sign that this was going to hit Europe or, or, or even Latin America. And, and when, when did you hear that the World Health Organization actually declared the, pandem the pandemic? Where were you at the time? What, what happened? Tell us a little bit about this. Yeah. Well, these are really a lot of questions at the same time. So, um, so uh, once you've been the dean for eight years at RSM, you're entitled to a sabbatical year. And initially, I just planned to go go ahead and work somewhere else. But then my wife said, you know, it's time to take some time out and, and better enjoy life while we still can. So we went on a sabbatical in South America for half a year traveling through countries like uh, Chile, which is an amazing country, and Colombia. And uh, indeed, like you said, we were stopped in Peru. Um, and we were totally taken by surprise because for a very long time, a lot of people were thinking that this virus is something that just erupted in China and that it will stay there like, like SARS 20 or 15 years ago. And when it gradually spread to Europe, still a lot of people in South America believe that since South America is pretty remote and isolated, it still will be a European thing, right? And, and I guess that also a lot of people in the United States at that particular time thought it will stay at the other side of the ocean. But then we were totally caught by surprise when the Peruvian president declared a, the state of emergency on March 15, and he said, we're going to close the borders tonight. So it meant that essentially we had less than 12 hours to escape the country if we would like to. And that was totally impossible. We were in the countryside. And uh, actually, it was pretty, in a sense, maybe premature that they uh, declared the, the, the state of emergency because at that time, there were less than 40 confirmed cases in Peru. So that's nothing compared to what happened in, in, in Europe or, or, or China. Uh, but in hindsight, hindsight, I think it was a very wise decision because if you look at the number of IC beds per capita, Peru has the least among all South American countries. So the healthcare system is not even close to what we know or what we enjoy in, in, in Europe. So for them, it was a really big threat. So initially, you know, we thought, okay, we're going to wait this out. Uh, probably in two weeks' time, four weeks' time, we're able to travel. But then gradually, you know, people understood, or we understood also the depth and, and the width of this uh, virus that's, not, that's going to stay here for a very, very long time. And although we were stuck in the countryside and it was a very enjoyable location, the weather was good, the food was good, we had lots of freedom. Uh, I decided, we decided to go home and, and use one of these repatriation flights because the big question is, when will commercial air travel resume, right? And no one can answer this question. So in early March, all major airlines suspended their regular flights for two months, so till the beginning of May, but probably, you know, my guess will be that you won't see commercial air travel resumed till the second half of this summer. And I didn't want to stay there for that long a time. No. But at the, at the, apart from a positive point of view, you know, uh, it gave us the opportunity to learn and appreciate the country from a totally different perspective. So initially, we were hopping from one side to the next and, and just uh, like ordinary tourists, we were on the way to Machu Picchu. We never got there. And then suddenly you're stuck for three weeks in the same place. And then you have to live and think like the average Peruvian uh, person, right? How to survive, how to get food, how to go to the market. Uh, you have to... Were, were you able to do that? Were you able to, were able to do that? Yeah, yeah. So especially in the countryside uh, at that time, you, were, you, were, you had to wear a mask. And if you wanted to enter the market, you had to wash your hand in a pl public space. Uh, but people were not social distancing at all. And at some times I thought that's pretty scary. 
At the same time, it was at the early weeks of the outbreak. So we were in the countryside. So initially, the most confirmed cases were in the big cities, not in the countryside. But over time, it, it grew scarier and scarier to go to such places. So, um, so, so, and, and you told me at some point that you, some days of the week, it was the men who could go and sometimes the women yeah. could go out. What, what is the story? Yeah, so at a certain point in time, it was a, a gender based uh, policy so uh, on particular days only women could go out on other days only the men and on sundays no one could go out <laughs> but they only tried this for one week or for 10 days and then they canceled it didn't work it didn't, didn't actually work. work right so yeah. after all they, they were staying in the same house together anyway <laughs> all right okay <laughs> well uh let's change gears a little bit and talk about solidarity this is a topic that i, I started mentioning earlier so before the corona crisis, in fact, the world was already in a mess, if you look at it. No experiencing serious social problems, geopolitical tensions. And, you know, some pessimistic people see this, some optimistic, I would say, see the crisis as, as really an opportunity to, to improve things, to, to make a better world. But there is another pe more pessimistic view. Other people say, well, in fact, what the pandemic is, is happening, if you look, is, is doing, if, if you look around, what is happening is that it's amplifying existing problems that are only accentuating, accentu sorry, <laughs> I'm getting stuck here, accentuating social inequalities that, 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 that already exist. And, and this is only going to have a, a greater impact on the most vulnerable. So clearly, uh, COVID requires some type of uh, national and international solidarity. And we could look at this from two perspectives. No one looking at the developing countries, which, you know, the, you were already mentioning some, some you know, cases uh, when you look yeah. at uh, Latin America, and, and the other one within Europe. But let's start with the developing world, because, uh, I mean, you know, now it's beginning to hit there, as, as you said, it, it, it gradually migrated now to other parts of the world. And, and um, when there is beginning to experience a pandemic, uh, you know, you realize that they don't have the high quality healthcare systems or good sanitation or even water or stable food supply. So, you know, the, the, the healthcare in these countries may well collapse without additional support. Uh, if you look at the uh, average, uh, you know, number of doctors, uh, there's 50 times fewer doctors and 20 times fewer hospital beds per, per capita than in Europe. And the virus will also have an impact on the food supply. In fact, a few days ago, I was listening to an interview with the head of the World Food Program, the, the UN agency. That he was saying that the world is at risk of widespread famines of biblical proportions, okay, caused by, by, by the virus, and therefore the urgent action uh, was needed to avoid a catastrophe, uh, saying that the, the number of people uh, you know, suffering from hunger could double in, in the world, reaching uh, the, the, the amount of 250 million, which is, which is huge. But in addition to that, of course, there are uh, financial problems as elsewhere. Uh, here, I, I, I read something I, I didn't know. I was listening to, to the BBC just two days ago, and, and, and um, a lesser known consequence of this pandemic is the sharp decrease in remittance flows. You, you know, these are the migrants, the migrants sending uh, money home. Uh, they, yeah. uh, the, there are a lot of people around the world that are providing financial help to their families. And um, these foreign workers are often the first ones to lose their jobs in times of crisis, right? So. Two days ago, the World Bank said that these flows around the world would decrease by 100 billion US dollars this year, which is a vital source of financing for developing countries. And just to give you an idea of how important this is, last year, those uh, remittances uh, overtook foreign direct investment to become the biggest source of capital inflows in low and middle income countries. And they accounted for almost 10% of, of, of their GDP. So no wonder that Antonio Guterres, the General Secretary of the UN, has called for countries to, to contribute to an, a, an international emergency fund to, to deal with this crisis. And, and even in the Netherlands, I mean, now going back to your you know, uh, country, um, there is also a concern about that, that there is lack of coordination and solidarity internationally. Uh, justice and peace, Netherlands, as well as another 40 ONGs have made a joint appeal in support of these countries. And they argue that support to developing countries and civil society organizations in this country is necessary and should be part of the emergency measures that the Dutch government should take. So they are appealing to the Dutch government to 
to send money to, to, to all this country. Now, what, what is your vision of this? How, how could a country like the Netherlands support developing countries at this time? And shouldn't the priorities be, well, here at home or, or even in Europe, given you know, everything that's going on in Europe? Well, uh, again, there are a lot of implicit questions, right, and, and, and claims. Um, now, you're right, absolutely right, that this virus is putting a magnifying lens to all the differences in the world, the different political systems, right? Uh, I mean, if you look at how China and Korea handled the crisis, how the U.S. is handling it, um, I, I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, I'm watching uh, uh, Donald Trump's live conference every night, right? I mean, I can recommend everyone to do the same because in a sense, it's incredibly entertaining. And at the same time, it's really unbelievable what's happening there, right? I mean, imagine that your prime minister would address the people in Portugal in that particular way. If our prime minister would do it, he would be locked up in, in an asylum. Right? I mean, uh, it's, it's bizarre. Um, at the same time, what you're saying, right, there are so many issues and problems surfacing, then clearly it's a matter of prioritizing which one to handle first. And in a sense, I think, I'm not saying it's good, I'm not saying it's bad, but it's like the instructions that we get on board of a plane. It says, you know, if you need an oxygen mask, put it on on yourself first before helping others or before helping your kids. So to a large extent, it's a matter of survival. So I think that first of all, Holland, but Holland is so small that we are really part of, uh, of Europe, so that Europe, the U European Union, should first make sure they'll survive before they can help others. So it's, to my mind, only logical that the initial focus, the initial, initial attention is on our countries first, before you look a little bit further. And then clearly, at a certain point, you understand that if you don't handle, if you don't address those problems, they will backfire in time as well. Mm -hmm. But what's happening right now, I think it's very understandable. And probably it's also the right thing to do with an eye on the longer term. But at the same time, it's creating very a lot of short-term problems. I, no doubt about it, you know, and, and, and it's very sad. Yeah, well, um, you know, we, we, we can talk about Europe, in fact. That was the, the, the title of our session, right? This unified yeah. Europe further than, than ever. Uh, some people say that the coronavirus crisis is really bringing into question what the EU is all about, right? Uh, and right now, many, you know, every European government is struggling to protect their populations, as you said, push the ma put the mask first, <laughs> their jobs, their health. Yeah, literally, maybe, economy. yeah. But, but you know, it, it looks as if uh, some richer countries like Germany are not ready to dig deeper into their pockets to help the, the poorer countries in, in the South, right? Um, yet, you know, you, you could say that Germany sent medical masks to Italy, has also taken patients from France and Italy to hospitals for treatments, but clearly it has rejected the plea by Italy, Spain, France, and Portugal and others to share out the, you know, the coronavirus uh, uh, incurred debt uh, in the form of the so-called corona bonds of euro bonds, and we may want to talk about this a bit later, but uh, what is what my point is that clearly Italians feel abandoned. I mean, you, you, you remember all these, these, these messages uh, that, that have been aired, and and uh, by the, the, the prime minister and others, and and um, they felt that there's been abandoned as as, as, were, as they were with the migrant crisis, in fact, no, and to the point that even the EU Commission president offered a, a, an apology to Italy for not helping at the start of its deadly Corona outbreak. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen yeah. told the EU Parliament, too many were not there when Italy needed it. Okay. Uh, and she keeps repeating, on the other hand, that the uh, only effective solution is cooperation, flexibility, and solidarity. But can the European Commission force EU governments to cooperate? In reality, no. Because no, of course not. Foreign countries, right? So the EU countries take their own decisions. So uh, Giuseppe Conte, the Prime Minister, said the EU could fail if it does not find a way to respond to this virus. Okay? The EU was raised and meet the challenge of what he called the biggest test since the Second World War. And some Italian and Spanish politicians also warned about the same thing, that if the EU does not act, their countries will lose faith in Europe, in the European project forever. So back to our question, is a unified Europe further than ever? How yeah. do you see the future of Europe? <laughs> so. 
I know it's yeah. a good question. And neither you and I are politicians, so we, we probably shouldn't even be attempting, but we all are citizens, and as citizens of Europe, I think we should be asking those questions, right? Yeah, but, um, you know, as you probably, well, you know for yourself, Holland, the Netherlands is a very small country, right? So I've always seen the Netherlands as a part of Europe, I would say still the majority of my fellow citizens would say, uh, uh, countrymen, sees Holland as a part of Europe, as an integral part of Europe. So for me, it, it's the same. But this discussion really revolves around uh, Eurobond, Euro bonds, right? Are they effective, yes or no? Um, um, again, I don't know the answer, but I also have very strong doubts whether it would solve problems in the long term. In the short term, it looks an ideal solution. I, I fully agree. But I can understand that a lot of people have serious concerns about the long-term implications. Um, but if, if you go back, at, that's what's happening right now, right? I mean, every country has its own set of policies, its own set of measures to fight, to, to flatten the curve, right? And clearly, to a lot of extent, it can be traced back to where you are. So Italy was one of the first, and then ideally other countries could learn. I think Italy for a long time probably underestimated the implications. But again, I mean, our government probably did exactly the same, and, and the American government even more so. So we could have been more proactive. But if you look at the measures, they're totally different. So uh, over here, like in Sweden, we got what we call an intelligent lockdown. So people are advised to stay at home, but you still go, can go out. But if you do, you have to adhere to this one and a half meter distance. If you don't, you're fined pretty heavily, right? 399 euros. But you can go out for shopping. You can go out for a walk. You can go out for a run. You can go out for, for, for biking and, and things like that. Right? And it works. Mm -hmm. In other countries like, like Spain, they're very, very strict. Also in France, you can't go out unless you got the permit. So that already begs the question, why are different countries having different measures? Right? Because they all want to, in a sense, achieve the same, flattening the curve. And if you look what's happening, all these measures are effective. And yet some countries have different measures. And I think to a large extent, it's also because of the trust and confidence that the people have in their governments or in their public institutions. Right? So apparently compliance is not really necessary here, at least not yet. So recommendations suffice. At the same time, my feeling is that if this if it doesn't change in the short term, people like will object more and more like in, in the US and become disobedient, right? But that's already a major question. So why do we have why are people behaving differently in different countries? Right? That's that's a good question. Uh, number two, I mean, it's really about the euro bonds. Are they effective, yes or no, right? And I'm not a financial expert. Mm -hmm. I, I know the stories. People have been thinking about it for more than 20 years, right? Yeah, I and, mean, that's, that's and, okay. it's not and it only surfaces in case of crisis. Then suddenly, you know, people talk about euro bonds. But I also have very strong doubts that it would work. And this was one of the red lines, and, and the, the, the reddest of the red lines, I suppose, uh, between the North and, and the South. And I mean, uh, Bruno Le Maire, the, the France minister, uh, was saying, this is, there is only just one question. Are we on this together or are we not? And he was pleading yeah. to the nations, you know, especially Germany, of course, to demonstrate solidarity and all these things, but the Netherlands as well, as you know. Uh, so, so for many peoples in, in Southern Europe, in fact, solidarity means only one thing, these Euro bonds, right? So France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, and other countries have thrown their weight behind the creation of these financial instruments, okay, as the best possible response to the pandemics. Uh, and, and the arguments that they make are both uh, political and economic. You know, uh, Euro bonds are meant to prevent some of the worst affected countries uh, being sunk with more debts, because right? then it's mutualized, right? Um, they also intended to show Europeans that we are all in this together. So the question of solidarity, the, 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 as we said. Uh, in fact, I, I, you, you may have seen that there was a, a group of Italian uh, majors and, and other politicians that posted oh, yeah. a page in the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung just uh, 
to, to, to remind Germany that they were never made to pay back their debts after World War II. <laughs> and, and, and by the way, they also criticized the lack of public support in the Netherlands as well, but that's another uh, side uh, <laughs> story. But, <laughs> but, but I mean, I, I read a, a, an article in Financial Times a, a couple of weeks ago that pointing out that, you know, the urge to, to demonstrate solidarity and alleviate suffering is right, but eurobonds are the wrong solution. So, and he was, the, the, the author was making the point that rather than saving the EU, they could have end up killing it. Um, they said that the Germans- yeah, That's my, that's my, my yeah, concern as well. The right yeah. to, oppose, to oppose that. So what, again, what, 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 is, what is your views on that? And what does that come Well, from? you know, so again, I, I'm not a financial expert, right? But you probably know the big downside for, of uh, euro bonds, and that, that's behavior. In a sense, right? Because what, what uh, the big risk is, of course, that certain countries will not stick to a, a budgeting discipline. Mm -hmm. So there's no incentive anymore to keep your budget balanced, your public uh, uh, budget balanced. And there is no incentive, there is no sanction if people won't stick to that particular budgeting discipline. So to a large extent, and, that, and that's in a sense maybe the parallel with different measures in different countries, it's to a large extent about perceived behavior. So what will happen if we have euro bonds and you don't have the measures in place for countries to, to, to uh, keep their, their budget balanced, right? And, and right now we don't have any in the EU already, right? And that will only grow worse. Uh, and at the same time, I mean, if you look at what happened during the financial crisis, uh, the EU does have some financial measures to bail out countries. Look at what happened to Greece, right? Clearly, it was at, on an ad hoc basis with all the discussions around it, but it worked in the end. And but in the, the end, was, the again, also was, the richer countries yeah, paid for it. I, sorry, but if I, may, if I may jump in here, I mean, I, just to now put my, my hat as Southerner, uh, yeah. the problem is the the conditions attached to that right so so you know countries Clear, yeah. have had to go through an incredible austerity and 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 therefore uh that's what people are afraid of uh i think uh, the notion of grants as opposed to loans uh it's much more welcome because at least the grant you know has a specific goal and you I give you the money for that and you don't have to pay it back by the way but even even uh, you know money which is lent with, without strong conditions uh, but still, I mean, we, we, we can talk about the, this is being debated as we speak. I mean, I think tonight the, 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 the heads of state or the, or the, are dis debating again a 1.5 trillion package. Uh, nice. and, and the other thing, by the way, is, is the mechanism, even if the, there are no mechanisms in, in place to uh, uh, make the euro bonds a reality at this point, because it would take months, if not years, to put in place. Oh, yeah, absolutely, because it's a very complicated uh, instrument. Yeah. Whereas the, 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 you know, anyway, so, so uh, as I said, the, the, and the other thing is, 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 of course, I mean, we, we can all understand this question from the South in the austerity. Now, if I look at the other side, the North, what, what is the problem? It's, it's a political question as well. And I think people sometimes uh, don't realize that. So, and you should look at Brexit, okay? So one of the reasons and one of the main arguments that you heard about this, you heard two things. Um, we're paying a lot of money to, to, to Brussels. And second, the other thing is that's not what we voted for when we joined, the, the, when we agreed to join in. So now, so when the euro was created, there was this agreement that it would not be used as a transfer union, that the North would be transferring funds to the South. <laughs> And, and that's still, you know, these are arguments that, that, that resound very well with the populist uh, movements, right? So, and then, then that's where the nationalists start flaring up in, in, in northern countries as well. And, and that could be the, indeed the end of the European Union. So that's why this is a very delicate and balancing act. And, and you, we should look at it, not only the solidarity. And the point that the uh, article was making is, Yes, it's, it's the wrong solution because we've been debating this for a long time and we shouldn't bring this now back on the table quickly because we need a solution yeah. for, for, the, for the crisis. Let's take other ways of funding yeah. this crisis 
but not the euro bonds that we agreed is very contentious because of we, we we've been debating this for for many years anyway i think that was the the point i don't know if you want to continue talking about this or we should move on <laughs> to something else i mean no, but, but for sure you know the, uh, still i sense a lot a strong need for the northern or the, what you call the, the richer countries to help the south i don't i don't think that this is the issue the, the issue is how yeah, uh, i agree i agree and uh, and also probably under what conditions yeah so it's probably not unconditional maybe in the short run it will be unconditional but in the longer for a longer term solution then probably what the richer countries would like to have are, are certain conditions uh, satisfied right? mm -hmm. yeah. So um, why don't we talk about a little bit about business? I mean, uh, you're in a business school. You 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 are a professor. Your your um, area of expertise is operations and supply chain management. Yeah. Uh, I think when we look at the future uh, beyond COVID, um, the implications for for business and society are are, are quite 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 big, of course. Uh, and and clearly one of the areas could be the effects on, on, on supply chain uh, management. Uh, globalization was already under threat before, you know, the geopolitics, nationalism that we talk about, and many other strategic considerations. But now, with the pandemic, the uh, globalization may have gotten his kiss of death, as I would say. Uh, we see global supply chains being disrupted, and perhaps that's going to be forever, or, or at least for a long time. We may have to reinvent supply chains, or at least we should put emphasis on things that we were taking for granted. And maybe risk management uh, will have to take a different. How do we build more resilient uh, supply chain? I mean, uh, I, I I read a recent report by the Institute for Supply Chain Management saying that 75% of the uh, companies are experiencing supply chain disruptions in one form or the other at this moment, which is very understandable. Okay, and other interesting figures that emerge uh, from the survey included the lack of a contingency plan for almost half of the companies in case of some supply chain disruption leading back to China. So everybody was taking China for granted. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and, uh, and more than 50% more than fifty of the companies, not surprisingly, then uh, reported sudden unexpected delays in receiving orders and even complete information blackout coming from China. <laughs> These figures really show how vulnerable uh, the global supply chains are and yeah, absolutely, yeah. a lot of our economies. I mean, you know, the, the percentage of goods manufactured in China 15, 20 years ago was very more, small compared to what it is today. And, and the complexity of how we have built manufacturing around the world with assemblies and sub-assemblies and parts that are sourced globally, and, and, and it's, it's, it's amazing. So we, when we think of it, uh, we don't realize that anymore. But even Brexit on, on, on a European scale put on the table these questions about, you know, we have just-in-time supply chains. Well, if Brexit takes place, what's going to happen that? So if we, we already had that within our, you know, neighbors uh, across the channel. Now imagine with, with China and the rest of the world. I think these are huge. Uh, so how, how do you see the, the present and, and the future of uh, supply yeah, chains? That's no, I think that the points that you actually already uh, identified are absolutely correct. So uh, th there's an important uh, paper, if I may quote it from maybe 15 years ago, that talks about stock market reactions to certain events that happened in your supply chain. And, and many have only very minor impacts on, on, the, on the stock price, but the biggest one was a, a supply chain disruption. So if a a listed company would report a supply chain disruption, then typically, on average, the stock price would go down by 7%, right? So imagine this is pro, pro corona and whatever, right? So at that time, and it also showed that on average, a company would have, would need two hours before it would be able to bounce back, right? So it's not a one time hiccup. Now, if they would report a supply chain disruption, they needed two years to fix the problem, right? So, and it says a whole lot about how 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 bad supply chain disruptions are. So, and clearly, in this particular case, it means that supply chains have to be restructured almost from scratch, because if you think about the supply chain, it's much more than just you transport goods from A to B. There are a lot of systems and procedures and policies in place 
and everything has to be rethought and revisited. Um, but also what we have been teaching in our courses and in business schools all over the world is that you've got essentially two types of products. You've got products with predictable demand and you've got products with unpredictable demand, right? So products with predictable demand, that would be your diapers, for instance, right? If you think about diapers, then it's very easy to predict, predict demand, right? And the, the theory would say, okay, products with predictable demand typically have low margin, uh, low margins. And those products would be produced far, far away in, in, in um, low labor cost countries. Because demand is predictable, it takes a long time before you get the product to the market. But never mind, everything is, is very slow moving and pretty smooth. That's the way to do it. And if you have a product with a... Uh, uh, with very high unpredictable demand, typically the, the margin also higher, think of fashion, and those products should be produced and sourced very close to the market. Right? That's the theory. But now, clearly with uh, Corona, th th this, this theory no longer flies. Essentially, and that, that's what we can imagine, is that in the longer run, countries would want to be self-sustainable everything needs to be produced and sourced source close by. And of course, that typically apl definitely applies to medical equipment, right? I mean, look at very simple, low-cost products with a very pr predictable demand like masks and, and, and gowns and you name it, right? Why would you want to produce them in Western Europe? It would be too expensive. So let's have them produced in China. But then suddenly demand erupts. There's a huge shortage. And then you realize it takes a long time to get it from a place that you can't control. And China could allocate them to any other country, actually to the highest bidder. So uh, for sure, it all, all talks about securing supply. And this can only be done if you do it in-house, so within the same country, or if companies, again, you know, may, may internalize suppliers. Um, so, and then there's a third strategy that says, you know, it would be foolish to have to be dependent or reliant on a single supplier. Correct. Because yes. happens yeah. with that supplier, you're screwed, right? And then every, we're teaching everyone you, you should have two or three, and you should apply the 60 40% rule. So, although this one supplier might be the best or might have least cost, still, you know, put your eggs in different baskets two suppliers but if two, these two suppliers are in the same country or in the same continent again it doesn't work right so we have to revisit we have to rethink everything mm -hmm. and, and um, clearly cost will go up you know cost will go up that that's for sure yeah uh, because one, one of the things about dealing with single suppliers and, and being a very well oiled machine is being all driven by efficiencies obviously Exactly. So yeah. you, you've been fine-tuning, you know, something that you took for granted was very stable, and now, now you need to... Uh, need to uh... Yeah, and, and under those normal conditions, it perfectly worked, right? It worked perfectly. You, had, you didn't have a worry in the world. Right. Yeah. question here is if technology can play so much a role in the future or, or not. Yeah, technology played an important role. I mean, maybe, you know, 3D manufacturing will become more important. That, that will get a boost, right? Because that allows local production. Um, have you seen the uh, press conference with uh, Donald Trump brandish these no swaps, oh, saying yes. that they're I now... Did. I, yes, I yeah. did, I did, I did, yes. <laughs> Actually, those could be uh, 3D manufactured anywhere, right? Okay. So I think that, that this is something that, that, that we'll see more of. Yeah. So um, there are there are some questions are beginning to, to pop up here in the chat box. Um, I will get to, to them in, in a minute, but maybe maybe there is a, one last question I wanted to judge without just taking into account the fact that you have been of a dean you have been dean of a business for a long time. Yeah. Uh, there is some background noise here. I do not know if it's at your end or my end, but I, I hope it's a, it's at my end. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's 
It's okay. Well, if you can hear me, I, I, I'll go ahead with a with question. So my question had to do a little bit Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, now it's okay. So my question had to do with uh, with uh, with the fact that you've been in business schools. How do you see the future of business schools? Uh, just quickly, what is Rotterdam School of Management? Uh, you know, doing these days. Um, are you shut down for business? Are you doing things online or not? Or what? Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's closed. So the campus is closed except for one or two buildings, but you need a permit to enter, and everything is online. And, uh, okay. and it seems to work, although there are some uh, challenges, yeah. one of which is actually exams for uh, the big bachelor groups, right? right. So right. you need to move to an online exam. So if you have a small group, you can, do have, you can have oral exams, you have maybe master programs or MBA programs. You can ask people to take, to have take home and to write essays. But for bachelor programs, it's more difficult. And uh, what, what we have been doing is we're using proctoring software. So essentially what it means is you online an exam and then you videotape all the time for three hours. And apparently it's just uh, uh, tracking your, your, your eyes, right? I mean, and if you suddenly are looking to the left way too much, clearly you're doing something you're not supposed to. Right? Okay. But then a lot of students would claim I don't have a webcam so, or my bandwidth is not sufficient. So it doesn't seem to be well. Right, okay. Uh, so that's one of the challenges we're having right now, online exams. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, in the executive market, do you know what's happening for executive education? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's come to a uh, still altogether. So what, what you're seeing in the world, of course, is a big difference between public schools. So RSM, to a large extent, is public. So no matter the government will keep on paying, right? Uh, and students will keep on coming. But if, you, if, if executive education is one of your main pillars, then you're really facing financial challenges. Yeah, don't because tell. on the one hand, <laughs> how can you deliver? Yeah. Well, probably still deliver this for a couple of weeks online, but you won't have any new enrollments. For, for a lot of schools, again, especially in, in developing countries, uh, it might be a deadly blow. Right? Uh, if you're dependent on 90% on the private market for your income, uh, it's not clear it's how not, to survive. It's not only developing countries. The, you, the, the, for many countries, uh, like in Australia, I was talking to some colleagues of mine in Australia that depend a lot on international students, in their case from China. They are completely uh, you yeah. know, confronted with major, major losses because a lot of their students are, are just not coming back. They went there for holidays and they're going to come back. So. Anyway, I think it's time to uh, look at some of the questions that have been coming. I, I, I do not know in what sequence, because some of them refer to the to the beginning when we were talking about the, the, the Eurobonds and stuff, and others more recently about these. Um, so, yeah, some person here says, have you been following the Netherlands position uh, at the European Union? Uh, <laughs> I think... <laughs> I, I do not know if that refers to what we talk about, the position about Eurobonds. Uh, and I think uh, a, a similar one. Can you comment on the current Dutch political scenario and its stance on Eurobonds? It's really because Mark Rutte fears another uh, Herd Wilders uh, on the right or something like that. It's, it goes back to the point I was, I was saying before, right? So uh, about, uh, you know, giving the, creating a situation yeah. in which nationalists or, or more radical parties uh, will exploit that well that, that's that's a very good actually that in the background that may play a role uh, but at the same time what, what you're what you're saying now at least in the netherlands you know that that uh, Rutte right now has an amazing uh, support from almost everyone in the country and uh, i wouldn't say we have a national candidate right now the minister of uh, health is actually from a left-wing party. And, it's because, and that's because we think, or Rutte believes, that he is the best expert to have as a minister right now in a particular department. It, it might be true that actually he's trying to outflank people like uh, Gert Wilders by, by taking this pretty harsh stand on Eurobonds. But to my mind, you know, if, if you look at the history of Eurobonds over the last 20 years, 
the northern countries have always been very skeptical about its effectiveness. And I, I'd like to say, that when you, you can't introduce them overnight. It's a very complicated financial instrument. So before it could be put to use, they're probably already two years down the line. And again, I, I strongly believe there are other measures that, that that would be equally effective or actually more effective in the, long, in the longer term. Yeah. So um, there are others that are not actually asking questions, just making statements like the euro bonds are right regardless of the pandemic, <laughs> but they are midterm solution that requires amending treaties and advocating single countries' financial independence. That's exactly the point why that we were talking about. And, 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 and that yeah. is probably a red line for some countries, not to mention the fact that something like that would take uh, some time. So it's not an immediate solution as we were discussing uh, before. The, uh, the ESM, uh, it's probably a better, um, a better solution, or at least there's a mechanism that's up and, and, and running. The... Um, Okay, let me see what tells we have here. Um, so, Corona, another one. Uh, coronavirus crisis requires an immediate response, and euro bonds are incompatible. Uh, citizens and enterprises need money right now. No delay. That's exactly yes. what the, the the heads of state states are, are are debating, and that's why this uh, huge uh, package is being uh, discussed through other yeah. channels, not, not, not the, the, the euro bonds. Um, there was another one here saying, um, do you think that the European New Green Deal could be the foundation of some sort of Marshall Plan for Europe? Yeah, hopefully, right? Hopefully. Um, so what you're seeing right now across Europe, is that especially different states would like to uh, support their national jewels, right? In yeah. Holland, we got KLM, part of Air France KLM. Uh, clearly, it would go bankrupt without enormous state support. And since we see it as a crown jewel, we really want to do this. Again, the question is, in the longer term, will that be effective? And every country will have its own jewel, right? Um, at the same time, a lot of people now put forward and say, you know, we, we, can, we will only support companies that will become greener over time, uh, that won't hand out huge bonuses to the top teams uh, and things like that. So they really want to put those kind of conditions for state support. And I can understand that because now, in a sense, it's a golden opportunity to change, your, change the world to the better. Right? So do you really want to support any company who might go belly up? Uh, the answer is no, I think. But how can you be selective? Right? Uh, again, I think that requires a concerted effort across Europe, because otherwise every state just try and save its own jewels. And that won't work in the long term. So again another comment that northern countries should not give out of charity however they need to support southern countries and ask for a realistic long-term debt reduction program but no blood and fears if not the bankruptcy of italy for example would imply the total collapse of the eu there is yeah no i agree yeah but italy won't go bankrupt I mean, <laughs> clearly the richer countries would never never ever allow this that's uh, <laughs> what but that's exactly why some of leaders like Macron and, and Conte are, are just putting that on the table. Guys, if you don't do anything, I mean, we're out of here. And then if we're out, the whole thing collapses, right? So this, this is this fear of, are we on this together or, or, or not, right? Yeah. Okay. So here is one um, on supply chain, really, uh, which is the thing that this crisis represents an opportunity for just-in-time supply chain models with smaller quantities and higher proximity, shorter distances from the factory to the consumer. Uh, the case of which is very close to Portugal is Zara, of course, in northern yeah. Galicia, which has been always shown as a model example of being able to, to respond very quick. And quick, in this case, is interesting because time is what you were saying before. So many manufacturers were concentrated on, on, on sort of... Uh, optimizing and grading efficiency and low costs. And they went all the way to China and all these places, but 
is the diaper model that you talk about, right? Mm -hmm. So they assume some some known and constant, uh, you know, demand. Very, uh, demand. Whereas whereas Sara said no. I mean, demand can fluctuate by the day if necessary. And they're measuring with with their computer systems what is being sold every day at the point of sale, and on that basis, feedback information to near source, uh, source very close uh, suppliers, so they'll be able to respond quickly to that. So are we going to see more Zara type models? I think that's the, the question. Well, essentially, that was already a big question for a lot of companies. Can, can we play the Zara model, right? Because it has so many advantages. And then the conclusion was, well, it was for products with a high demand predictability because, you know, that it's costly to a shorter distance, just in time supply chain. For what products can you actually fix, right? Uh, it requires a certain margin. So uh, I don't think you can have all sorts of products, but definitely the move will be to shorter distance supply chains. Right? People will would want to have supplies that suppliers that are close to buy. And I guess that certain industries will be labeled as uh, as critical. And and it's already happening in the US. For sure, Europe will follow suit. So these are things that we need to be able to produce ourselves. We can't leave it to uh, to third. So, should we be seeing labels as uh, made in, in the Netherlands or, or made in Europe as opposed to made in China and made in the US? Yeah, yeah. So, a, a nice example is uh, ventilators, right? So, ventilators are produced, uh, among others, by Philips Healthcare. Yes. It's produced in the United States, right? So, and when we had a huge shortage of ventilators, we were really afraid that Donald Trump would invite in this uh, defense, whatever act, and just confiscate all ventilators because there was also a shortage of ones. Well, luckily he didn't, but he could have, right? So, in order to prevent that kind of issues and problems, for sure, people are going to rethink what are the things that you want to be able, that you want to have that you want to manufacture close by your own countries or in the EU, for sure. There is another aspect that we that probably was taking place irrespective of, of the virus, but maybe two things can be linked. One is we were entering in Industry 4.0, manufacturing in, in many, in many uh, countries, and that was supposed to be the, the, future, the, the future, the Internet of Things, distributed intelligence, so some of these things, some of these things are all in the future. Because clearly, machines are not, uh, they may be immune to other types of viruses, 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 viruses but not the biological uh, viruses, right? So I, I guess what I'm saying is, I guess what I'm saying is would, would uh, it be a way uh, to think about the future, uh, about the technology can help um, and artificial intelligence, some of these new technologies that we have been uh, you know, seeing um, um, that help in this global supply chain problem that we were talking about as well. Yeah, clear forward will be, you know, people are going to use all these technologies and, and like big data and AI to mitigate or prevent uh, risks for sure. I mean, it's weird not to do so. To what extent? I'm not so sure, right? I mean, people have been down on manufacturing for a long time, except maybe Germany, right? So uh, uh, if you were a manufacturer, I mean, clearly the margins would be thin. You, it would be much better to work in distribution or in IT or other, other areas. Uh, for sure, you, you will see a surge of manufacturing companies. They will be re-appreciated. Re they, they, they will use any means possible to, to try and do the best and and, and nice things and, and and be be competitive, right? Because even in Europe, you know, cushion is very strong. It's not like uh, uh, um, you don't compete with other countries. The, the big question is also how long will mem will the less we are learning right now? How long will they be remembered, right? Uh, as stressing, this is a one life. Uh, one, uh, one, uh, a lifetime event. Everyone will remember this for the rest of their lives. Uh, but 
it might be true that as we are learning right now, we'll all be forgotten in a couple of years' time. I would not be surprised. Right? Well, that's uh, funny because people some don't people, learn. I, I don't know. I, some people have the opposite view that there are things that we will have learning get and used to it. Uh, and, and video conferencing, what we are doing now, having meetings, uh, you know, some people said that the virus has done uh, what technology experts have been trying to convince us all along and we never did it. And now here Listen, we are, doing a lot of on online uh, meetings uh, uh, and so forth. So what you're saying is that once conditions go back to normal, the new normal will be like the old normal. Some people will say, no, the new normal will be different. And, and, and that's, that's a big proposition. Because in, 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 in manufacturing, I can see that you can take, uh, take uh, a lot of information. So we have been used to, to work away from the factory, from the home, in our case, from, from the schools, from, from the services. But in manufacturing, if a lot of information is lost in the cloud, for example, if there are digital, uh, you, know, uh, you know, queens, as they call it, you know, that, that all that information that replicates what's happening in the world, is world. Now they can be accessed far away. Maybe we can also see another another, another, thing, another way of uh, supply chains in the future. Did you? Yeah, I was muted. Uh, no, I mean, and that, that sounds, of that looks like a plot that, that you find in some of the movies, right? That everything that suddenly disappears and we're totally lost. Uh, right now, it's, it's beyond our imagination, but this is also something that could happen. Um, I mean, you were referring to our earlier travels before. I mean, when we left the Europe and went to South America, we had no idea that on a, upon coming back, we would find a totally different world. Mm -hmm. It is something you can't imagine, although we all know the story about the, the, the Spanish flu 100 years ago. Right? But, but you all thought this is not going to happen ever again because we are further advanced. We have much better medicine and vaccines and medical care. Medical and yet here we are. Right? It's unbelievable. <laughs> Uh, look, uh, I think we could go on and talk about this and, yeah. and, uh, and, and many more lessons learned. I think uh, we're reaching the, the, the end of our time, and uh, I do not know if there are any more questions here, but uh, I shall this, one last this, one. One last one. Shall this situation shall put Europe in an even more servant position versus the U.S. high-tech giants with great yeah. and IT knowledge? And IT knowledge. Uh, uh, I believe that, that actually we will become less dependent on the U.S. Right? If you see what kind of we're facing, uh, every, everything is focused inwards. I think one of the things that we're learning is that Europe is on its own. Um, there was a very interesting article in Times, I think this morning or last night, and it, and it says for the first time in, in 100 years, the rest of Europe is not looking at the U.S. for leadership in times of the big crisis. I think that's absolutely true. And I was referring to these press conferences by Donald Trump earlier. You know, it's a joke what's happening there. I mean, people are really fighting in the street over what's going to be done, but it's just a political fight. Mm -hmm. And at least that's not what we're having in Europe, right? Okay. Um, okay. Look, yeah. uh, look. I think we are really at the end of our, our time. Um, so I think that we will have to show more solidarity. I think that's one of the things that we, we've been discussing here with the volume. Yeah, I agree. I agree people. fully. I think that was one of the, you know, the, the red thread in in this whole conversation. The discussion. And, and here in Europe, I, I hope that, you know, our, our leaders will have uh, chances to demonstrate solidarity. And, and, and as you said, we may be left on our own, but uh, when it comes to rebuilding Europe economies after the crisis, I think uh, a lot of leadership will be will be required. It is in their own interest, of course, to survive. It's also in our interest as, as citizens and uh, EU's rep reputation and, and the, the strength of the single market depend on it. So thank you, Steve, for uh, your interest. My pleasure. Uh, for the exchange of views, and I hope that we will see you again in other activities organized by, by, by our school. And, uh, Thank you to all viewers for joining us today. And uh, remember that uh, every week, uh, Porto Business School hosts the webinars. Uh, 
on uh, beyond now Tuesdays and the Dean's Lounge on, on Thursdays. So uh, goodbye and bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank bye you. Bye. <laughs>